Hello, good afternoon or good morning, good evening to everyone. Um, I'm Zachary Kipping, a software developer and Angular Bootcamp instructor with Oasis Digital. And I'm gonna be talking about uh, router state management for this Angular launch this week. Um, the way this talk kind of came about was I've seen a lot of projects recently um, and in my recent past that have kind of made use of the router in various forms, but haven't really fully made use of how state management really works with the router. Um, and we'll kind of get into that here with the slides. So let me go ahead and share my screen real, real quick. Uh, go ahead and do screen two, there we go. All right, so let me get these slides going. Okay, so again, Zachary Kipping, my GitHub and Twitter handle are on there if you care. And then um, for the demo that you'll see later, the uh, GitHub repo is there on screen as well. And then I'll link all of these slides as well at some point as well. Okay, so starting off, um, hopefully everyone kind of is aware of this, but there are three main state types of router state um, that you can deal with um, in Angular. So there are route params, which are essentially bound to a particular route and are required for rendering a specific component. Um, and there's also query parameters, which are a global optional state that is basically can be accessed anywhere in your services, your components or whatever. Um, so basically anywhere inside your routing tree. And then there's this third type that I'm probably not gonna to talk too much during this talk because it doesn't come up that much. And they're kind of like a little bit of a rehash of query params, um, but there's also something called matrix parameters which is basically kind of the same optional state as query params, but they are bound to a particular route. So they're not accessible anywhere inside the application. They're only accessible to a particular component and a very particular part of the routing tree. So matrix parameters are kind of a mix of route params and query params, but not gonna be getting into those too much in this talk and this um, demo we'll see later, just because again, query params, matrix parameters, you can make use of either. I typically make better use of query params than I do matrix parameters but they are out there and they are pretty cool to use as well. Okay, so I talked earlier um, that I kind of made up this talk because I see, saw a lot of common scenarios and projects that have been inside the past. So a lot of those projects either have kind of like two different situations they went through. They either had a situation where they used routing and to kind of display their pages, display their features, but they didn't really make use of any actual router state. Um, a lot of the state selection, like if they would click on an entity and go to another page, that was all being stored inside services or indirects or whatever, and they weren't really making use of their URL bar. Or a second path that I saw a lot was applications that had a lot of like entity dependencies, where if I click on a company, for example, and that company has a whole list of projects that you could click on to kind of view, um, you would see something like this on the screen where you have slash companies, slash some ID, and then if I were to click on a project, then I'd be thrown back to the root of slash project slash some ID. So just from that like situation there, there's no real correlation that those projects and those companies are related in any way based on the URL. And in a lot of cases with those applications, those projects I was on, we had a fun case where if you would refresh the application, you would literally end all the way back up at the home of the screen because nothing was either stored in the route or there was not enough data being stored in the route to be able to recreate where you were in the application. So in order to solve that, it's pretty simple. You just need to make use of the state management that the router gives you inside of Angular. And one key kind of um, idea here with using um, the state management of routing is an idea I kind of like refer to as bookmarkability, where I should be able to bookmark pretty much any page in your application, refresh or go to that at any point and be able to be booted back into the system with all the data kind of populated as it needs to be, as as if I just left and came back, right? So in that previous example, when I had like company slash some ID and project slash some ID, the best way to probably do that is with like a longer URL here you see on the screen of slash companies slash ID slash projects slash ID. And at that point, you can basically recreate the entire state of your application just based on the router state. And here we'll get into query parameters later as well during the app demo application. Um, but you can be also making use of the query parameters. You can kind of recreate things like searches, filters, things like that on lists of data, even forms as well. Um, you can kind of recreate where people are at in case they refresh or they bookmark a particular page in your application. All right. Um, another key point with this is also reusability. So this is less from like a user 
um, use of your application. Like the user love to be able to bookmark pages and come back to them. But from a developer side, you want to be able to have your components be rebuilt less often. And you also really want um, the backend to not be pinged constantly from fetching data that you already should already have kind of cached or loaded in the background. So making use of like all these routing strategies that we're about to see in my demo app, um, making use of uh, route params and career parameters and all those things can really make your application one, rebuild components less because you'll be kind of navigating correctly and also make less backend calls because things are being cached, things aren't being re constantly um, fetched from the backend. And then also just in general, making use of these patterns are a little bit more straightforward um, than some like ad hoc homegrown kind of solutions to doing state management with the router. So the concrete patterns there kind of allow for more easy expansion um, and easy learning for developers coming onto a project as well. Um, another one I'd like to refer to is called uh, application navigability, which is an overly complicated word. We're basically saying someone should be able to actually navigate through your application in a simple and easy manner, right? If I were to click on a company's list and I click on a singular company in that view, and then I'm presented with a list of projects, and if I were to click on a single project in that list, you would expect the URL to kind of represent that flow, that path I took through your application. Um, so being able to have that actually like means something to the user and that fact that they can either bookmark it or actually kind of figure out where they are inside the application. And from a dev perspective, it just makes your actual code and things like that a little bit more organized. And we'll see that here in a bit. Also a bit here of like entity um, dependencies and whatnot. So if I'm unable to load a specific piece of data, maybe a project without knowing which company it come from, comes from based on like however the queries work or whatever on the backend, then the routing state actually handles all that for you as well. Right, and then later we'll see also making use of relative navigation. Um, this is one huge thing that I see um, applications not make use of enough, that whenever you're trying to navigate through your application, I see a lot of people just recreate the entire URL from root, like replugging back in data, redoing all the stuff over and over and over again. Whereas if you just make use of relative navigation, it's as simple as if you're using like change directory and doing local um, directory navigation inside your OS, right? You're using your dot slashes, using your dot dot slashes, things like that makes everything quite a bit easier, right? And then this last bit here is more about the data accessibility side of things. So um, we'll see this here in a bit with my application, the demo application, but realistically your services should house a lot of your state, right? A lot of your, at least from a perspective of a complex large app, right? A lot of your components might or might not store state, it just kind of depends. But if more complex your app gets, a lot of times the services start handling more of the data layer and the actual state of your application. So it's nice to be able to use things like the query params or wrap params and things like that inside your services to kind of clean up um, fetching state, dealing with state inside your components as well. All right, and we'll kind of see how I make use of that. Uh, a little bit of some custom code there in a bit in the demo application, but we'll kind of see how we make use of even wrap params, even though they're supposed to be bound to a particular component in the router tree, you can kind of get them to be global state like the query params as well. Okay, so before I head into uh, the demo application, I just want to point out real quick kind of the upcoming schedule that OD or Oasis Digital has on um, trainings and events and things like that, just so kind of everyone's aware here. So currently today we're doing the um, advanced Angular lunch, which usually happens on Wednesdays about once a month. Um, we also have quite a lot of other things coming up as well. So we have our Angular clinics, which is kind of your chance to come out, get some questions answered from a lot of our experts at our company. Um, it, when we call it a clinic, we literally mean that. Just come to us with your questions, your problems, your concerns with Angular. We'll try our best to answer them or give you feedback or kind of give you a path forward um, in terms of your code and your projects or whatever. Obviously, don't bring too much project sensitive stuff to that um, because, you know, issues with securities and policies and things like that, but we'll do our best to help you as much as we can. Um, we also have our Code Talk Teach um, podcast that happens quite pretty often, like once or twice a month. Um, that's more just like commentary analysis on current state of Angular, specific topics. We do a little bit of banter back and forth as well towards the beginning. Um, it's kind of just a fun time, good thing to just kind of listen to in the background while you're having lunch or whatever. Um, and a lot of these things are also on YouTube as well. So if you can't catch them live, you can catch them after the fact as well. Um, some cool things that are coming up along with just the teaching side, we have our Angular boot camps. We have our, also have our Angular for Architects class, 
Um, if Angular for Bootcamp is more of like the starting outside, Angular for Architect is like trying to answer the big questions of how Angular fits into a situation at a project, things like state management, um, routing, styling, uh, libraries, releasing strategies, stuff like that. Like all the big picture problems and things like that you would probably want to answer for. Angular for Architect is kind of a good class for that. Um, and then also we just have various other um, events coming up as well. I think we also have RxJS events coming up um, April 15th here as well, which should be pretty good. Okay, um, so enough spewing about our Wix digital events. I'm gonna go ahead and talk about my demo application here. So this application is more or less kind of built on upon the fact that I have entities that have relations with other entities. Um, it's kind of like a tree of, of a data model. So, and at the very root of my application, you're basically presented with a list of companies. Um, here, I could potentially search for some companies. They're all pretty much named the same thing, um, but I could for, search for a very specific, specific company um, if I want to. Um, and you might see, um, it might be a little bit hard, just kind of depending on the Zoom level, um, but all this stuff is being fed into the query parameters in the URL bar. So if I were to type company two here, you can see that up in the query params, if you can't see it, I can probably open up um, a file here real quick. So my URL looks like something like that. So I'm getting those query params, I'm plugging them into, inside the URL, actually allowing for that bookmarkability that I talked about earlier. All right. So getting that in right off the bat is good. And then it's kind of feeding straight into my actual list here as well. So anytime I search, it does a new load of my data and we'll kind of see how I'm dealing with that RxJS pipeline here in a bit in my, inside my global service. So at this point, if I want to, I could click into any one of my companies or I could create a new company, right? I could create a new one, get a form, say, let's say new company for demo or something, right? And then create that company. You'll see that instantly triggers a new load of my data and I get that new company down there. If I were to click into any of these companies, I am presented with like a company view page. Um, more or less, this is just me throwing the data on the screen as JSON. And then I'm presented with a whole bunch of different buttons here. Um, one is quite simply for going back. And this basically just goes up one layer back to the list of companies. Um, I can delete the company, I can edit the company, I can view the projects for that company. So if I were to edit the company here, my URL will look something like this. I'm going to bring this into that other file again. So my URL bar looks something like this. So slash company slash one slash edit. So I have a company selected and now I'm trying to edit it, right? So the URL bar here represents like the state of what the user is trying to do inside your application. And it's extremely important for like bookmarking things and refreshing, right? If I were to refresh the application at this point, I come back in here um, and that is uh, not what's supposed to happen, but um, realistically that would feed back in and you get the companies inside the actual data there. Um, same thing goes for if I were to go back to this list here, if I were to type like company here, if I refresh uh, my application here, you'd see that filter just fil feeds right back into the input. And uh, you basically just bookmark the state of your application, load inside that URL, and you're basically presented right back where you were. It's kind of what we're going for here inside this application. So where I start getting into nesting of things is here. So I, I've clicked into a company and I'm looking at some projects now. And now I can either go back up, I can search some projects, um, or I can click into a project as well. So as I keep traversing this application and going deeper and deeper, I can kind of see my URL get longer and longer. So here at this point, now that I'm inside of a company or a project, excuse me, my URL looks something like this. So I'm on slash companies slash whatever that ID is, probably like more like a hash in reality. Um, projects slash one, so some type of ID or hash. So basically, as I'm traversing my application, going deeper and deeper inside my routing branch, I'm recreating that inside my URL as well. Instead of either one storing all that stuff in like global state like with NGRX or services, or just having like flat root branches that don't correlate to where the user is inside your application. Right. So enough talk about the UI. Let's actually took, take a look at the code because the code is actually pretty interesting for this. A lot of RxJSC stuff going on and dealing with the state management of these applications. So um, taking a look at this, let's go ahead and look at, um, let's take a look at our constants here just so we're kind of familiar with what they look like. So what I one thing I typically like to 
prefer to people doing is kind of keeping track of what your actual like param key, wrap param keys and query param keys are um, just as a global scale as some sort of basically just magic strings. So this is where I store a lot of this stuff for this application. So I have my project one for searching. I have the project wrap key for actually selecting a project. And the same thing goes with the company as well. And here on the service side, we can see that I have a company, pro company project or company folder, excuse me, housing my company service, one for the project. And then I also have this magical router state service. Now the company service isn't doing a whole lot. Um, and it's doing a decent amount because it's also a bit of an API layer as well. Um, but besides all the CRUD operations here at the bottom, realistically, it's just setting up a series of pipelines for my components to look at. So there's the company search query that exists here, the company list that's being kind of displayed inside that UI, what company is currently selected, and what that actual entity looks like for that company that's selected. So one's the ID and one's the full entity. And the reason why I'm splitting all this up is to kind of make my life a little bit easier on the code side, um, just so I know specifically which things are what, and I can reference these anywhere inside my application if I want to. I could reference these companies in the project service, I could reference them in the components, whatever. Right. So kind of setting up some global um, RxJS pipelines here. So no surprise, but the uh, company search here is coming from the query params map, right? So we're pulling that router state here, which is kind of this router state service, which we'll take a look at in a bit. Um, this is kind of like a wrapper or alias around the actual activator route service. And we'll see why I'm doing that here in a bit, but the query param map and then some of the router param stuff is coming from this magical router state service. But there we're just pulling the query param map. If you're not familiar with query param map setup, um, it's basically just an observable that represents kind of like a map or an object of key value pairs. And from there, you can kind of just select whatever um, optional key that you're basically looking for. So in the case of the company service, I'm looking for this optional company search query param. At the same exact time, I'm also looking for the projects one as well. Project service has a pretty similar setup here with that project search query. So both of these queries are being looked at at the same time, whether they exist or not, is completely up to where you are in the application, right? They're kind of optional global state. Now, the fun part of this service is kind of making and combining a lot of these streams. So in order to get the companies list here, I'm combining the company search query here, and I'm combining the fetch companies, which is kind of like a, um, a trigger behavior subject. So I'm basically just using this to refetch my stuff after I've done any API calls for creating, updating, or deleting things. And past that, I'm basically just, um, I had a little bit of a delay here um, just to make things a little bit more realistic since everything is kind of like on a local JSON server. But pretty much I just take that query that spits out from the company search and I throw that up to my API it is kind of the gist there. But based on that, so I'm basically combining the query params and a trigger to fetch my data at any given point. So whenever this application first starts, um, the company, um, search query is going to be pretty much null um, if I were to go back to my application here, right? Go all the way back to root. So that thing is null. If I were to refresh the application, I just get the full list of companies because there is no query, but I'm still trying to fetch that data. And then once I actually introduce a query, um, that'll impact what is actually inside that list observable as well. All right. Um, also on the side of actually selecting a company, I'm actually doing that on my service too. So a lot of applications I see like have to go through the same kind of um, junk of getting the route param outside of the component, like inside the component, to throw it up to a service for it to do an API call and get all that stuff and recollect it back on the component side. Well, personally, I don't like to do that as much when I don't need to. Um, so if I were to hop over to, let's see the company view for example. The company view component is relatively straightforward for something that is kind of depending on a route param, right? Only thing it's doing here is it's getting the selected company from my service and then basically just throwing it inside the UI. And then it also has some stuff for deleting the company and all that um, junk from that button. But realistically, there's not as much stuff to do expect here, right? And a typical application you'd probably expect here, we have the activated route, right? And you would actually be pulling from the wrap params here, doing a switch map, going off to your service, making that API call, getting that data, and then possibly doing something with it, right? Inside your component, displaying it, putting it inside of a form or whatever. 
this case, though, I can basically just grab that from my service. Um, it's basically, it's considered almost global state and I can just throw it on my screen whenever I need to. The nice thing about this being global state is when I go back and forth from, let's say like viewing the projects list, right? And going at this project, you can see that this project just stays loaded in the background the entire time. So I don't have to refetch it every time I come back to this component. It's just kind of cached in the background as long as I'm kind of on this path, this branch of routing inside my application. Right, so that's kind of the perks of making this router wrap pram stuff a little bit more global um, in terms of your state management. Now, the way this is actually happening inside this application is pretty much based on this router state service, which is kind of like this magical thing that I have in my application right now um, that basically makes the wrap params global. Now, for anyone that's used um, NGRX in the past, there is something they have called the router store, which does something pretty similar as this. So if you make use of NGRX, I'd actually recommend going that path and making use of that router store. Um, you can get your query params or route params and things like that out of there. And then you can make selectors and go that path. But if you're not making use of NGRX, doing something like this is relatively straightforward in order to make like your route params and things like that a little bit more global and accessible inside the state of your application. So here, all we're really doing is we're making a uh, merge of some code here. So we're merging a defer here of like the initial application routing state. Um, the reason why we're doing a defer here is just to make sure whenever this route params map is actually loaded is when we actually go do the initial work here of finding the initial um, router state. And then past that, we basically rely on some cool events that the router actually spits out as an observable. So the router um, is not only just the thing you use to navigate and um, get like the URL and stuff like that, the router itself um, actually spits out an observable stream called events. And this has like navigation in, navigation start, all that cool stuff that you might see whenever you have um, logging enabled in the router module. Um, so you can basically just access that list of events as a stream. And if based on that, you can um, basically just pull out the entirety of the state. So the router state here. Um, I basically extracted it all to this pure function down below, um, which is doing a little bit of recursion here to basically suss out all of the route params out of the um, router state. So this will basically just go through all the branches and all the tiers of your system, pull out all the router state key value pairs, plop them inside of one object, and then you're good to go. So having done this, you basically get something that looks kind of like your query params, but for your route params now. So your route params are kind of like more like global state. Um, typically, I wouldn't normally recommend this because like having the router state defined by your components is pretty good, right? Um, it's something that's required by those components to even display, but also making this global can help with various paths as well. If you need access to the company on various different components, you don't want every single one of those components to have to go and refetch the company um, based off the ID and the route param and stuff like that. So doing something like this to make it a little bit more global can help satisfy some of those demands of um, multiple components, multiple layers of your routing hierarchy, needing access to certain entities and whatnot. Right. So at that point, you just kind of um, take that raw data we're getting out, make use of the convert to param map that the router gives you. Um, this will basically just, instead of being like an actual JavaScript object, a JSON object, it'll be converted to an actual pram map, which is what the route params and query params are inside the activated route state. And then past that, you just share it so you don't get any leakage um, and you're not constantly recalling this thing over and over and making more instances of work. All right, and then past that, I just re-alias my query params map so that I can just point towards this one service. Um, I don't wanna have to point towards multiple services here so I can just get everything from this one service, the route params and the query params. And this is basically a recreation of kind of like that router store that NGRX has. So making your router state more global. Right, and some of the fun where this comes into is if I were to look at the um, project service here. So the project service, um, based on the way my kind of data model, model is, um, I need the um, company ID to actually go and try and fetch the um, uh, projects list, right? So if I were to look at that initial projects list um, back over here, if I look at the view projects, um, whenever I want to view this list of projects, I actually need the company ID, right? So 
In order to do all that inside like my project service, I'm making use of the company service and I'm making use of some of my other um, kind of trigger uh, behavior subjects and also like my query params and all that good stuff as well. So my projects list is a little bit more complicated than my company list here. Um, it's basically a combination of that searching and that trigger, but it's also a, a um, addition here of actually looking at the company services, like the company ID. So actually getting out that route param that's supposed to be not global, right? It's supposed to be kind of bound to the activator route on a particular component, but instead I pulled it out to that global state and now my project services can make use of it and it makes everything a lot more simple. So I basically just grab that company ID, my query, I throw that up in my API, right? And I get back a response on a list of projects that I can display on my screen. And the reason why this is nice is, you know, I do a lot of complex stuff in my service, right? It's where a lot of my state management is, where a lot of my RxJS logic is. And now my actual components in the views, I would pop over to um, the project list here. Project list is pretty straightforward. The only thing it really does is it grabs the um, projects list from the service and literally just throws it on the screen with an async byte. It's probably as simple as it can get. But in the background, you know, it's making use of query params, it's making use of those route params, making use of all this complex router state logic. Um, and that all gets spit out as a single observable that's reusable. I can use it on this project list view, I can use it in a different component if it needed it, et cetera, right? Um, as long as the route params and things are set up, the query params are set up, pretty much any view, any feature of the application could make use of the service. And then down below here, you can see that I just have some additional logic for actually doing that searching. If you're not familiar with how to do um, query params uh, setting on navigation, this is something you can do. Um, typically, this is like one of the few cases where I have a manual subscription on something, right? Um, even our own company kind of spouts not making use of manual subscribes as much as possible, use the async pipe, do stuff in the template as much as possible. This is one case where you're using like a form control or something, and you want to put that data inside the URL on your query params or whatever. This is one case where manual subscribe is kind of warranted. So we're kind of subscribing to that project search control I had on my screen, just that text input, and then throwing that data into the query params here. So basically just telling our router.navigation function here that we want to stay on the same page so we don't give it a new URL here. And then we fill out that query params object um, with our key value pairs that we want. All right, um, another side thing I kind of want to talk about along with the um, kind of global state setup with this um, application is relative navigation, right? So relative navigation is another fun um, key point I want to take people to kind of take away from this project. Um, so if I were to hop over to like the project selected view, for example, um, you can see that uh, instead of doing like, so let's go back button, for example, instead of recreating the entire state of my application to go back to the um, project list view, right? So if I were to hop over to my UI real quick, I'll show you what's going on. So if I hit this go back button, it's almost as if I'm hitting the back button on my actual Chrome browser, whatever browser you're using. So instead of trying to recreate the entire state of the world when I do this navigation, right? Replug in all the values for my state, replug in all the paths for the router, I can actually just make use of like dot dot slashes and dot slashes, which is a cool, awesome thing that I don't see used very often in a lot of projects, unfortunately. Um, so people having to recreate their entire route when realistically you can just use like these dot dot slashes to do relative navigation. Um, the syntax is very similar to doing like change directories and things like that um, on your um, OS. All right, so almost like if you're doing import statements in your TypeScript or whatever. All right, so there's dot dot slashes for going up. There's dot slashes for um, being within the same uh, branch essentially, but hopping to a different or a different layer horizontally. Um, and you can also do these multiple, right? So if I wanted to go up multiple layers here, I could go up two layers. So if I were to click on my projects here, if I click the go back button, I now hopped up two layers all the way back up to my company view, right? So um, you're basically just relatively traversing your router tree with this bit. Um, this is the easiest way to do it inside the template. Um, you can just kind of use this relative navigation out of the box in the template. But if I were to want to do this on, <clears throat> say by TS, right? So doing this kind of manually in your TypeScript code, there's a little bit extra to be able to kind of get this functionality. 
Um, so it's a little bit quirky in the way you need to do this, but by default, the uh, router.navigate here, that's something you would call inside your TypeScript code, your component code. Um, this does not by default do relative navigation, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, basically that uh, nav link here, this router link inside your template, that directive does a lot of the support work to make your stuff relative out of the box in the template. But if you wanna do that from your TypeScript code, you basically gotta recreate that functionality, unfortunately. So here you call that navigate function. I give it like the dot dot slash that I wanna go to, right? If I delete this project, I just wanna go back to the project list. Here, I can give it a relative to value. And this is kind of where you say, hey, Angular, hey, router system. I wanna relatively navigate, and this is kind of where I'm at in my application. So you hand it the activated route, which kind of stores that information of like what data is loaded, what part of the branch is loaded, what part of the router tree is loaded. So you pass that information in, and then like everything just kind of works after that. <clears throat> okay. Um, I think there's a few other things I want to talk about. Um, and I think I have about five minutes to talk about them, which is perfect. Um, taking a look at some of my router modules here. So the nice thing about um, using lazy loading here um, is I have this company form module. And this company form module is loaded in one of two ways. It's loaded when I am creating a new company and when I'm editing the company, right? So you can see here, it's loaded on this edit path. And this edit path has access to, um, excuse me, uh, this company route pram key, right? So if you ever have a chance to look through this application, the kind of the routing setup is pretty um, large. So I won't be able to get through all of it, but um, essentially every single layer of this application has a new routing module and it kind of sets up the branches and layers um, that are needed. So in our case, at the very top of the application, we have our company list. If I want to create something new, I go to the company form module. And if I select a company, I click on something, I get that wrap frame in the URL, then I go to my company selected module. And now everything that's housed inside this company selected module, which um, is basically the rest of the application, all the projects, the company edit form, all that good stuff um, is housed underneath here. So at that point I can say, this company view component has access to that wrap frame. This edit component has access to that wrap frame and this projects path has access to that um, wrap frame, right? So that's kind of where we're getting with this. So the form module here has access to that data. Um, and it's kind of reusing this form module as well, which is kind of cool, right? Um, another side note here is whenever, you, whenever you're using the relative navigation as well, you're not gonna be recreating your or recreating your components and refetching data. Um, if I were to look at this company view, for example, if I were to go to the view projects, I have to load in all these projects, but if I were to go back to the company, I didn't have to reload this company at all, right? Um, the only time I would reload it is if I selected a new company and then it hits that loading trigger. So some of that data is kind of cached by making use of these wrap params, these query params and things like that as well, which is pretty cool. Okay, so I think at this point, I kind of uh, explained majority of the demo application. It'd be kind of cool to see and get some questions out from people um, just so we can kind of either explore other random parts of it or just talk about um, impacts of like using the style, using the route params global, using the query params globally and how it impacts applications and projects. Um, I kind of like to see if anyone has any questions around that area um, or if there's any other bits of discussion people want to talk along in terms of um, state management using the router. I'll, I'll ask a question to get warmed up. I'll wait for other people to jump in. Sure. Um, well, the first one's more of a question, more of a comment than a question, which is like the jerky thing you hate when people say at conferences. But this one is positive. I just love seeing that async await, just like your code ah, in your example yeah. is just so clean. Like, wow, it's just, I really love that. Um, I also loved having the param key in a variable name. That way you could like have it like, it's almost like almost like it being typed across the app. But my right, actual yeah. question was on your, in your, your examples, you did a thing in the code where you, you did relative navigation, but you know, from the navigate command instead of in the template. Mm -hmm. And when I've done it before, I had some irritation. I don't remember the details, but maybe you can tell me. But like I had some code, it was in a service. And if I injected the thing into the service, like it didn't work. I had to inject that, that you know, to get the relative thing to work, I had to, I had to inject that current route 
ah, from a component. Yeah. Like, can you can you tell us? Yeah, like, so that's what, what was like, happening to me, and how can I make it not? <laughs> right. So the fun, like, I guess not really fun, but the interesting thing about the activated route service is it's going to be a different value, a different object, pretty much dependent on where you are in the application at any given time. So activated route typically inside your services isn't going to have access to any of the component layer data. So things like route params, those matrix parameters, things like that, not going to have access to, and there's not a lot you can really do there. It has access to the query params because query params are global. They're kind of outside the actual router tree. But the irritation a lot of people hit, and I did with a lot of my projects as well, is if I want to go and fetch some data, I can't just say, hey, service, go get this thing, like my selected company, for example, right? It was a route frame. I can't just say, hey, service, go do this, right? Uh, making use of that activated route. You actually have to like either get the route frame key in the component or pass the entire activated route service from the component to your actual API or data layer service, which is really annoying. So that's kind of where my um, like global route frame setup comes in to where, and NGRX does a lot of this too. So they have like a global store of the route frames that makes the dev ergonomics a little bit easier, right? It's a little bit more straightforward. You can get those route frames whenever you need them, wherever you are inside the application. You could be at the root of the application. You could be in a very um, far sung um, component, or you could just be on some random side branch that, hey, I'm not really part of the router tree, but I still need access to that route frame and that stuff. I don't wanna have to constantly go and re-inject that route frame from the activated route, do some switch map stuff, do some API layer stuff. So introduces a little bit of caching, introduces a little bit of easier dev economics as well. So yeah, unfortunately it's just the way it is, or at least the way it's implemented inside Angular. And you just gotta do some stuff to get around it or increase the dev economics, I guess. Well, I've got another one. I'll give other people a chance though. Yeah, you can either turn on your uh, camera and mic and uh, ask the question or the chat works as well um, for any questions. It doesn't have to be specifically about routing and state management. It could be kind of ancillary as well, um, but kind of anything related to project or whatever. Well, if other people want to come up, with, I'm going to ask my other one. So in your introduction, you mentioned matrix routes. Right. And I had to step away for like five minutes in the middle. So maybe I missed it. Did you show us matrix routes? And do no, yeah. Them? So I, like, I, I mentioned them just because they are part of like the triage or trilogy of like route param stuff. The interesting thing with matrix parameters though, is like they don't actually really get used that often. They're like kind of like a more niche case for data. So a lot of times the question for me is when, like, when it comes to kind of like optional state um, is should I use matrix parameters or should I use query params? And the kind of deciding factor there is query parameters are global. So a lot of times it is easier to work with and matrix parameters are bound to a particular component, like particular route. So they're more like route parameters in that case. So whenever I come to that situation where I have some like, like optional state I need for a component or a view or whatever, I tend to lean more towards query params because they're just easier to work with, easier to access. I can kind of get them in my service without having to do a lot of extra work. Um, but if you do kind of need that situation, like very specific and niche where I need optional data, I actually want it to really be bound to the specific component, this particular route, this view, then matrix parameters are pretty cool as well. Cool, thank you. I'm gonna keep asking until others show up. That works. So, I, like when 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 you know, groups I'm in started doing Angular kind of early on, we often had our routing code like with our module, with with each module. Mm -hmm. But then the way the CLI sets it up, it makes the separate routing module to put your routing setup in. Right. Do you know why it does that? And like what, what is the benefit of that? Like, is it just because of, is it just to get it in another file to make it easier to manage the code? Is there, because yeah, there's something deeper about how the router works that makes it important and valuable to make a separate router module, like for each module. Right. I, I think honestly, it's just more of like a separation of concerns because like your, your core module that you're using to kind of orchestrate all these imports and declarations and like exports and all this stuff, 
is kind of what it's supposed to be, right? It's meant to kind of orchestrate all the stuff, do all the imports, do all the exports, do all that stuff. You don't want to kind of mix it with all this router logic because even my stuff is like relatively simple and it was still like 50 lines long or 60 lines long, right? Um, you're not talking about like getting like resolvers, any kind of guards, any other type of extra stuff that might be inside the route objects. So, so when you start getting into like a more actual, like, um, like uh, larger applications that are being used in production and whatnot, you start running into those situations where your route objects get pretty large. Um, and it's kind of nice to have that separation of concern. So I go to my routing module, I know that's where all the route objects are, where all that kind of configuration code is going to be. And then if you need to, you could actually also make like reuse it too. Um, if for whatever reason, if you ever actually need to reuse that routing module, you can never really run into that case. But again, splitting the code out allows for that possibility at least. Um, so there's that, I guess. So I got another one. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised. No, normally I ask a question, couple and then a bunch of other people start asking. Sure, so usually, yeah. In your example program, you did a, you did a, a combined latest of some state but then you did, you did like a merge of an of with an initial null value. Right. And I, I missed the explanation of that couple of lines. Can you I'll like- Go ahead and share that again. Yeah, show us that bit and kind of clarify. I mean, it's kind of more of like an RxJS. Yeah, it's more of an RxJS thing, but a lot of this application is kind of yeah, RxJS. Right there, right? yeah, right. Like line 57. Yeah. Like what, 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 what right. is the what, what is the goodness that comes from that? I think I know, so, but I want to know for sure. Yeah. So the reason I'm doing this is to kind of um, clear out the existing cache state here. So whenever I enter a situation where either I need to fetch new projects or my search query has changed or even my selected company has changed, I want to go ahead and send out a new null value right away to kind of clear out the cache state. Um, and if you're looking at a screen, you'll kind of see that loading symbol pop up the null is kind of driving that. You could have some other type of object or something driving that as well. I'm just doing a simple null value here, um, just based off how NGFs work. And then I also merge in the actual thing I want to do, right? Where um, I go out to my API, get that stuff based on the company ID and the query. And then I added a fake delay here just because JSON server like gives stuff back like instantaneously when you're on localhost. Um, but that actually will drive that kind of that loading bar that we saw in our application here. So if I were to go back here, um, if I were to search or something here like that, I get that loading symbol for a little bit and then I get the result of either nothing was found or like company one or something, company two is found kind of clear out that cache state and go with something new, yeah. And that's great. I mean, like we see a lot of like real production apps, you know, from like companies that, that otherwise take things quite seriously where like when you navigate, you're like still looking at the old data for a yeah, while. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, you know, it's, it's like, it's not obvious. Has it changed yet? So, okay, right. so, and, that, and, so those like two lines of code are how you, it's all it took to avoid right. looking at stale data while you're waiting for the new data to load. Yeah. And even nice. in the case of like editing an entity, right? If I were to update this value, right? Um, I, it's going to trigger a loading and then the new value is going to repopulate. So you're not just looking at the old stale data that you just edited. Um, yeah. You get that loading symbol and then the new data pops in. 